So as far as blood goes, we did the basics with plasma. We went through red blood cells, with white blood cells, and then platelets and hemostasis, which means just clotting. So as far as the basics in plasma, you should just know overall what's the job of blood, what's the composition of blood, and then specifically getting down to the plasma itself. So the plasma itself, we can see in this picture at the top, like a whole blood, if we spin it down to so the second layer here, that is really the hematocrit. So you guys remember, you should know what hematocrit is. So where you spin it, put blood in a capillary tube, spin it in a centrifuge, the cells get winged off to one side and so then it separates it from the plasma. So you can see the plasma component, it's roughly 50-50 um, or a little less in the plasma. So men tend to be closer to the 50% line, women tend to be under the 45% line with regard to the content of red blood cells. In just the plasma side, it is 90% water. And then in the plasma part, 7% of it are made of proteins. And you should know the three most numerous proteins in there. The most numerous being albumin. Albumin is a large protein. Who can tell me where albumin's made, as well as all the rest of the proteins? The liver. The liver. So the plasma is gonna be made of the albumin, so that's coming from the liver. Albumin is a large protein that actually stays in the blood. And what is the purpose of albumin? It's a carrier protein. It's a carrier. So things can bind onto it and just get shipped through the body. What's another purpose? Retain water. So if you have these big protein structures in the blood, when the blood gets to a capillary bed, where there's just a thin little veil of endothelium between what's in the blood and the tissue, there's a lot of protein out in the tissue. So albumin helps to balance that concentration out and that makes water more likely to stay in the blood. So if somebody has some sort of liver, a compromised liver situation where they're not producing enough blood protein, specifically albumin, they will have edema because they, have, they don't have as much stuff that's maintaining an osmotic gradient to hold that water inside the capillary. Um, the next most numerous protein that's gonna be in the blood are the globulin family. What are the two main groups within that family? HDL, HDL LDL, which is in the lipo, lipoprotein grouping, and that's commonly known as? cholesterol, yeah, and the HDL, LDL being good versus bad cholesterol, but the lipoproteins are just cholesterol. The, what's the other one? Globulins. The immunoglobulins. The immunoglobulins are going to be like your IgA, IgE, all those that we talked about with the immune system, so that's in that family too, circulating. Fibrinogen, what does that do? Blood clotting. So we know, and we'll talk about that when we get to the next section. So fibrinogen is really the last step in forming fibrin, which is the actual clot strands. Red blood cell production, regulation, structure, and function. Where are they made? Full marrow. What do they do? They carry oxygen. Just, yep. So there are oxygen buses. That's just their sole purpose. Regulation might be how do we make more in our body? What is a condition that would cause our body to make more red blood cells? which would be low oxygen environment. So low oxygen environment, which occurs at high altitude or higher altitudes, would increase your red blood cell production so you have better delivery. The structure, what does it look like or shape like? It's a biconcave disc, which really just means it's like a laminated inner tube. Why is it shaped like that? It doesn't have a nucleus, it's missing some organelles. And so the reason why it's missing some organelles, so if for, there's two reasons. One is that it can pack in more hemoglobin so that it can bind to more oxygen. Since its job is to carry oxygen, if we can unload some of this other organelle crap that we don't want to deal with, we can fill it up with more hemoglobin and have increased delivery of oxygen. The other being it can twist and turn and bend more easily. And so it can make it into smaller, tighter corners, small capillary beds without obstructing. And so we don't have to worry about. It. So that's where some diseases like sickle cell anemia, where they, um, the, they become rigid or ill-shaped, then they become problematic because they get obstructed some of the capillary beds and there's limiting the flow. What is the lifespan? Since we don't have a nucleus, it's not going to last very long. So how long does it last? Four months, about 120 days, exactly. 
what happens to it when it gets to the end of its life? Gets devoured by macrophages in the spleen. What part of the spleen is doing this? So the red pulp is like this reticular, loose reticular connective tissue. The red pulp snags these worn out red blood cells, macrophages, other phagocytic cells will go in, consume it, break it down, it's all digested, excretes it out, and then the iron that gets broken down, that returns back to our bone marrow so we can make more red blood cells, and the other components are just considered waste, the majority of it being bilirubin, that's going to make its way through the portal system to the liver, and then the liver can dump it out. So you can increase or get your bilirubin levels increased, which is jaundice, if you're either breaking down a lot of red blood cells and your liver can't keep up, or the liver has other issues that it's processing, so it can't keep up. So the not keep up could be one way to raise bilirubin levels, um, or it's just having a hard time excreting it out to the body. So you're either increasing the load going in or you're having a difficult time processing and excreting it out. So one way people can assist in their, their liver in breaking down the bilirubin is just going out into the sun, being exposed to the UV light. That breaks down the bilirubin, so when it arrives to the liver, it's not really having to do as much to it, and it can more easily process it, and you can get rid of it. The anemia. What is the definition, a simple definition of anemia? Low oxygen delivery. So you can do that in a couple of ways. What are the three types of anemia that we have covered here? Aplastic anemia, which is not making enough. You don't make enough so that you don't have enough delivery. So that's why you're not delivering enough. You don't have very many oxygen buses. Then we have a hemolytic anemia, which is breaking down. It's just breaking down or you've made ill-formed red blood cells. They're really not just doing their job or they're just... So pernicious is sneaky because it's not like, hey, we're breaking them down or we're not making enough. Those are the two obvious ones. Pernicious is sneaky because it doesn't mean either one. You actually have enough red blood cells and they look like normal red blood cells except for one hemoglobin inside. You need vitamin B12 in order for your bone marrow to put, in, put together the hemoglobin. Those are the three types of anemia. And so that's why it's more accurate to say lack of oxygen delivery. You're either not delivering it because you don't have enough red blood cells, or you're breaking your red, red blood cells down, or your red blood cells have a reduced carrying capacity. So those would be, all of those are covered by that definition. So what is polycythemia then? Too many or higher than normal red blood cells. So it doesn't always have to be a pathology. It could be you're just living up at altitude and you just have a higher hematocrit. And hematocrit is how you would measure it. You would just look at someone's plasma as long as they're properly hydrated. So if they're dehydrated, that can be changed the result. So a normally properly hydrated person gets their hematocrit done and there's whoa, well over 50% of their blood, especially if it was a woman, then that would be polycythemic because there'd be higher than normal red blood cell levels, usually because they're at altitude. Some of the tests, so you should be able to know how to do blood typing. So you know that the blood typing is always done on sort of the card here, and it always has the three wells. So even if they're not labeled, you know the first well is always going to indicate an A marker. The second well will always indicate a B marker. And the third well, by standard, is going to be the plus minus. So you should be able to know that if there's some clotting, say we have clotting in the first two wells, what would this, what blood type would be indicated? A, B, this is A, B negative. What if all three of them? A, B positive. What if just these two? B positive. What about these? Just the end one being? That's O positive. What if none of them? Oh, and I have six out part will be for you guys. You should also know about blood typing. Who can donate to who? So if we were to say, well, you should be able to recall, and the easiest way to think about it is the donor's cells. That's what's going into the body. Ignore the plasma of the donor. That's not a non-consideration. So the cells of the donor going into a patient or recipient and that person's plasma antibodies. The antibodies 
of a person tell you what not to give them, basically. So the answer should be, if I were to ask a question of, can this blood type, and I may have indicated, donate to this one. I'm just, if I do it graphically, or if I say A, donate to B, your answer would be no. And the reason being, not that they're incompatible, but the reason being A, cannot donate to B because the plasma antibodies that are anti-A will bind with the incoming red blood cells with the A marker. That you're identifying it's the A marker of the red blood cells incoming and the plasma antibodies of the recipient that's doing the reacting. So that's the answer that you will want to include in terms of your justification for or against um, a donor being, donation being able to happen. The RH factor, you should be clear about hemolytic disease of the newborn where it only affects RH negative mothers if they have an RH positive baby. If an RH positive mother, it doesn't matter. She already knows about RH. There's no antibodies that are gonna be made. It would only be an RH negative mother that would be exposed if she had an RH positive baby. The first baby would be fine. It would be any subsequent babies after that. So they're given Rogam to prevent the antibodies from being made in the first place. So white blood cells, what are the five types of white blood cells that you need to know? Neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, basophils. What, tell me the three that are granulocytes and have a crazy nucleus. Neutrophil, eosinophil, and basophil. So those are the granulocytes. They each have little packets of granules. Each one's gonna have a unique content in their granules. What are the two A granulocytes? The A meaning there are no granules in it. Monocytes and lymphocytes. What does a lymphocyte look like? Yeah, so it's the smaller cell. The majority of the cell is made up, is, is just filled with this nucleus. And there's a tiny little sliver of cytoplasm to the side. So they're distinct in that way. A monocyte is going to be slightly bigger, and often the walls of it are kind of more wavy. They're less defined. They could be all kinds of different shapes, so they, but they tend to be bigger, and they have a large nucleus, but that takes up not the major, well, they take up a lot of the, nucle of the cytoplasm, but not as much as on a lymphocyte, and it's often like a kidney bean shape rather than being nice and round like a lymphocyte. If you had a high level of neutrophils what in general just for just generality purposes for this class what condition would a person be considered to have an acute bacterial infection so the key is acute in that it's a really recent onset infection what about lymphocytes if you had a high level of those we'd have a viral infection and and there could be bacterial causes too certainly it takes a while for those levels to go up while they're figuring it out. So in general, it sort of tells you that there's something more significant that's ongoing in that case. What about monocytes, if there's a higher level of those? Much more of a chronic. There's a higher, it takes a while for those, the, them to develop higher numbers. So the, the infection has been going on for some time. So those are things that's happening over a longer course of time. What about eosinophils? What would the person be worried about if they had a high eosinophil count? Parasites, yeah, ew. And then what about basophils? That would be an allergy, allergic reaction. Mm -hmm. So those, so you should have an idea of what their normal percentages are, and then what's going on if there's too much of them, what their job is, and then you're gonna see a picture, a couple pictures of these guys. So I'll be naming them and then answering some of those types of questions. So the, what we just did by saying, hey, there's too many lymphocytes, or there's too many eosinophils, that test is known as a white blood cell differential, because you're telling the difference between them. It's different, it's more precise and, um, than uh, just a white blood cell count. The count just says, hey, there's a lot of them, or there's not very many of them, but it's not telling you what's more or less of. So the white blood cell differential is giving you what those are. So we're looking at part four, platelets and hemostasis. Platelets are cellular derived. They are pieces of cells. So they also originate from the bone marrow. They are little chunks of cells that are circulating around that when they hit 
exposed vessel wall components, they become activated and they stick to it, they get activated and they cause additional platelets to then come and stick to them to form an initial platelet plug. So you should be comfortable knowing the process of the clot formation and really the three basic steps. So I'll draw in black the components as we go through these steps that's already in your blood, that your body's already made. And then we'll do in colors what things get converted into that they're um, as, they, as each step progresses. So we begin with platelets. Okay, platelets that are gonna clump together. So we're gonna go all jam up, dog pile together. And when they clump together to form a temporary platelet plug, what chemical comes out of that? Prothrombinase. Prothrombinase combines with calcium that's already circulating in the blood. These two guys together will cause the conversion of prothrombin to become what? Thrombin. Thrombin is going to facilitate the conversion of what? Fibrinogen to fibrin. Okay, so fibrin is the clot itself. Fibrin is now these little fibrous strands. Red blood cells get stuck in. It looks like a big beaver dam. If when we're done the clot and we don't want it around anymore, what does our body make that would break up fibrin? Plasmin. What is something that you can give to somebody that would break it up? Streptokinase. Mm -hmm. Where would aspirin work to impair this process? Yeah, so aspirin is going to minimize platelet aggregation. What about Coumadin? Coumadin blocks the absorption of vitamin K and therefore reduces the production by the liver of prothrombin. So you have less prothrombin available. What blocks the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin? Yes, this would be heparin. Okay. So these in red are considered anticoagulants because they're preventing the formation of fibrin. Plasmin, so that's known as a fibrinolytic 